central planning, their core thesis is, well, we, we smart people need to control everything because we just can't let this you know, economy, we can't give this to the dumb rubes. Hello, everyone. George Gammon outlines the key reasons why the ongoing election is the most important election in the American history and shares his best candidate. Subscribe now, hit that bell icon, and embark on an enriching journey toward financial success. Let's unlock the potential of these markets together and pave the way for a brighter financial future. Welcome aboard. It's extremely important to understand what this country was built on when deciding you know who to vote for because i think a lot of it's just noise you know trump goes out there and just says whatever he wants to say who knows uh you know kamala harris is just basically a sock puppet but they have this policy you know whether it's tariffs or whether it's price controls and this and i'm for abortion blah 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 blah, blah whatever right to me that's pretty much all noise this is the signal. What is your position on free speech and censorship? Let's get over to this and you'll see what I'm referring to. Actually, first and foremost, I think this tweet from Luke Rudowski sums it up really well. I've seen quite a few people wear this t-shirt in airports, make Orwell fiction again. And Kind of the the basis for what I'm getting at right here is this push that you guys have seen. Again, I know I'm preaching to the choir about how we need to censor misinformation and disinformation and malinformation and blah, 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 blah. When since 2020, the people that have been most guilty of spreading misinformation have been the entities that accuse other people of spreading misinformation. A great example here, mainstream media, Bloomberg. I tweeted this out last night. Disinformation is permeating the 2024 U.S. presidential election on an unprecedented scale. Really? Well, first of all, how do you know that? Like, how do you quantify that? And secondly... If disinformation is permeating the 2024 U.S. presidential election, it's coming directly from the mainstream media. It's coming from the people like Bloomberg who are accusing the plebs out there or Russia or Putin or whatever it is of spreading this misinformation and disinformation. They're the ones that are doing it. It goes back to what Barnes uh, says all the time. I go to bed. A good buddy Robert Barnes, which uh, someone told me he got from who was the psychologist Hewn Yoon, if I'm saying that correctly. You guys can you guys know who I'm referring to. But it's confession through projection, confession through production projection. Anytime you see someone that's talking about how we like Hillary Clinton as an example, that we need to censor disinformation we need to censor this censor this censor that you know they are the ones that are most guilty of lying and the people today if you don't study history you can sit there and you can actually justify this well well maybe i don't know maybe we should censor misinformation maybe we do need the thought police out there i mean maybe it is benefit i mean my goodness gracious if people are saying something wrong about the the cervasa sickness medicine, well, that can lead to bad things. You know, this is the justification. The bottom line is the argument is always, 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 if we don't censor people, it's going to be dangerous for the population at large. This And we're going to go back in history here to the beginning of the United States. But this is always, always the argument. And what we see every single time is the people, the entities that are arguing for in favor of censorship, 
that are arguing against free speech are always the bad guys. Always. 100% of the time. They're always on the wrong side of history. The people who stand up and fight for freedom, liberty, and freedom of speech are always the good guys. <laughs> They're always the people who have been on the right side of history. So why would today be any different? Let's get into this article, and you are going to be blown away, I know I was, by the parallels of what we have lived through in American history and what we are living through today in 2024. This, uh, I want to give a shout out here. This is learnliberty.org. So if you just, I'm assuming if you just Google that in history of free speech in America, this article will come up. I strongly suggest reading the entire thing. It's, it's fantastic. But I went through and highlighted some of the key talking points. So first and foremost, they talk about how freedom of speech is something that's very unique to America, at least the way we frame it or our worldview. Let's get into it here. Americans have a constitutional right to put forth dissenting ideas, dissenting ideas. So if you believe that masks are nonsense, that is a dissenting idea. And remember the argument back then was, well, they're private companies. I'm talking about social media. Well, they're private companies. They're private companies. And I agree with that. The private companies should be able to, this is actually where I disagree with Barnes slightly. Because his view is that it's the, the town square or something like that. I forgot how he refers to it. We've actually had this conversation. But for I'm almost an absolutist. But if that's your business, right? You, look, if you don't want to serve gays, or go nuts. If, if you want to only serve gays, if you want to only serve blacks or whatever, if you want to ban certain speech, if it's your business, I mean, go nuts, right? But what we found by Elon Musk buying Twitter is that's not what's happening here, is it? What's happening is the government is coming in and effectively banning speech through pressuring or through this relationship, crony capitalism, whatever you want to call it, with the social media platforms themselves. So this is stemming from the government. And of course, the social media platforms, most of them are sure we're happy to go along with it because they all buy into this narrative as to how it's their duty to censor because these ideas are dangerous, right? As though this is the first time in American history that we've had this debate. <laughs> Let's keep going. You'll see what I'm talking about. So something individuals can be fined or thrown in jail over in many other countries. The significance of free speech in America is deeply rooted in history. Indeed, freedom of speech and religion played an important role in the founding fathers believing that free exchange of ideas and opinions, free market of ideas. That's the best way that I can describe. I've got to remember that because I think that's the best way to describe this. A free market of ideas. And look, in a free market of ideas, it's going to be just like a free market economy. There's going to be, pardon my French here, there's going to be shitty businesses, right? <laughs> and just like in a free market of ideas, there's going to be shitty ideas. But that doesn't mean that we need to have centralized control. That doesn't mean that we, just because there's shitty businesses that are going to go bust and people are going to lose money, they're going to lose jobs, they're going to do all these things, that doesn't mean that a better system on net balance is central control in communist Russia where none of the businesses go bust. It really, once you study this stuff, it really goes back to 
you know, I call it the Malthusian cult, which is spot on. But it, it, it's also the eugenicist cult. Because what is the view, the, the, the core view, of someone who believes in eugenics? It, it's, it's simply that there are some people that are just inferior to others. <laughs> Literally, inferior. You know, not based on their character. No, just based on their skin color or based on the size of their head or something like this, right? And therefore, those people, those genes just should be completely eradicated. You know, we pin that mostly on the guy that ran Germany in the 1930s. You guys know who, exactly what I'm talking about. Where did he get most of his ideas? He got them from scientists in the United States. And in fact, one president that we're going to talk about here in a moment was, let's say, infamous for his views on eugenics. But if you think about what that view entails, it's, it's, it's a view of central planning. Because central planning, their core thesis is, well, we, we smart people need to control everything because we just can't let this you know, economy, we can't give this to the dumb rubes because they're so stupid, they're just going to blow everything up. Or they're going to ruin everything. And in fact, there's just, like Thanos said in the movie, the Avengers movie, there's just too many mouths and not enough resources. You see, again, it, it, it's, it's why the Malthusian view and the eugenicist view is almost, it's like peanut butter and jelly, <laughs> right? In a very disturbing way. And that's, how we conquer this and how we defeat these bad ideas of Malthusianism or eugenics is, you guys know the punchline, free speech, free speech. Because this is what allows people who have dangerous views like MLK to come out and make these speeches that are now iconic that quite literally tr change the trajectory of history. It's not just civil rights here, anti-war. The government, and this really hits home now because of everything that we saw, that we, you know, it's, it's, it's getting a little less hysterical today than it was a couple years ago. But remember when Russia invaded Ukraine? I mean, that was completely bananas, bananas. If you weren't for World War III, then you were basically an American or a domestic terrorist, right? That's how you were being treated. If you didn't have that Ukrainian flag on your Twitter feed, I mean, you might as well be fired from your job because you don't deserve to have a roof over your head. I mean, this is literally how people were thinking. And what's I, it's so ironic that we actually used that law to our advantage to talk out against the war, the Vietnam War, the Vietnam War, and now those the, the same mentality, the, the war hawk mentality is trying to suppress speech once again, especially you know a couple of years ago, around the dissenting view that, hey, maybe we shouldn't get involved with World War III. Getting back to the article, the government's, and this is a Vietnam War here, the government's attempts to suppress dissent led to court cases that further expanded the scope of free speech protections. Opponents of the war utilized their right to free speech to voice their dissent. And again, I'd like to remind you, who was on the right side of history in terms of the Vietnam War? And here's another component that is just so damn ironic. Back then, the media, believe it or not, was on the side of free speech. You would think it would be the exact same thing today. 
But in this crazy, upside-down, perverse world we live in, the, the media is the main opponent of censorship <laughs> I mean, or, or the main perpetrator, uh, the, the, the main uh, promoter, I guess is the best word, of censorship. Thank you for watching the interview highlights of George Gammon. If you enjoy this highlight video, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.